squat, scorn. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the number one place to give the internet even more internet by making your own website. Squirn. It's been a weekend for the topsy turvy. Two big upsets in the tier two game as teams outside the 2019 World Cup defeated their qualified counterparts. Italy's first half hour providing the All Blacks with the sternest defence they've faced all year? The Black Ferns were utterly uncompetitive for the first time in their history and apparently the winning team is now the one who complains about the perfectly correct referee decision for four days on end now apparently. But nothing was truer or more upside down than one fact. This weekend gave us about 68, 69 internationals to watch and they all stood by one baffling anti-expectation rule of thumb. The fewer points scored, the better the game. And so South Africa's tense, drenched, one try only trip to Wales turned out to be one of the most enthralling games of the year, played at a mutual pace, intensity and quality no live crowd in Europe has seen for several years as the Springboks stole the win from Wales in the late stages. So how did the world champions secure their first victory in Cardiff for eight years and is this a step forward or backwards for Wales after deservedly winning the Six Nations and then being destroyed by the All Blacks last week? Are they moving forward backwards? Let's find out. About two years ago an almighty deity in the clouds after the global pandemic and the Wuhan fish mark with the dual goals of keeping the principality roof open so she can watch Test Match Rugby in Cardiff and killing Henry Slade and so every game at the Millennium Stadium now requires an open roof for Covid compliance reasons and hence sometimes now Wales can and play home games in the rain. This is new. And while certain figureheads of Welsh Rugby Twitter, that deity's favourite creation, would have you believe this is unanimously wonderful for Wales, this week it caused head coach Wayne Pivak to rip off his tactics just hours before kickoff and implement something completely different last minute. And we saw that something different distilled down into maybe the longest opening passage of play I've ever seen. First passages often last less than 40 seconds, at most they're about a minute and a half. Yet Saturdays went on for almost five minutes as Wales demonstrated the tactics pretty exactly for one they want to keep the ball in play they wanted to keep it alive there's a bizarre old school idea that watching the opposition backs pass the ball around their own backs is the kind of thing that knackers big packs out best but jogging back and forth for lonely chasing kicks is way more tiring but there's more to the tactics at this point, the only phrase I've said more often in my life are I don't talk about refereeing and oh sorry, was that your cupcake? But the Springbok kicking game is not about territory or even pressure, it's about momentum. It's about always being the team going forward regardless of who has the ball. So the second their endless supply of white short beef boys can't generate that for them, they kick. The Springboks typically kick about 15 metres forward at a time. That allows them not just to get the winger into superb position to get under the ball, but the entire pack to flood around the catchers. If the opposition beat Mapimpi or their friend into the air, their reward is getting eaten alive by some 18 foot tall creature on day release from Joburg Zoo. Equally, if the chaser can only get a tap back, they're in position to regather. Kicking long gives the fullback time to assess his options and the Springbok don't want you to have it. You want to, you want to deny that at all costs. They want the opposition to feel more under pressure with the ball than they felt without it. The whole game plan is about never risking going backwards, about always being the team on top. So the box take the kickoff and slap it back, putting enough pressure on Reece Samet that he fumbles it and Tompkins has to regather. But instead of giving them an opportunity to apply pressure, Wales just kick it right away and they kick long. For the new 50-22, Hardwick Pollard has to mark the wing a little bit more than usual, so Bigger hangs it with great height in field and over his shoulder, meaning he has to retreat onto the ball. He has to go backwards. A great chase by Nick Tompkins means he slides even further back. Literally the second and any Springbok takes a backward step, they kick it. So Wales know what to expect, and right on cue, Yankees hangs the kick, the standard 15-20 metres, and Bigger can regather himself. That's a net gain here of about 20 metres, and the Springbok momentum gain negated through one clever kick by Dan Bigger. This was what they looked to do all game. The aim of the Welsh kicking was to turn the Springboks. Low, long kicks have broadly gone out of fashion lately, but they became an essential part of Bigger's arsenal. Here, splitting the Springbok cover and forcing Willems back towards his own line, that forward momentum broken, and a perfect counter-attack opportunity if Zamet and Williams don't get stupidly in their own way. However, also, right, a word for Makazoli Mapimpi, who's working the high ball goes way beyond his ability to actually regather, which is really, really good here, and sets up the try. Here, right, he retreats right as the kick goes up, meaning when it comes back down, he can run onto it forwards. Quagga Smith then regathers. Also, while I'm talking about it, right, nobody's mentioning it, but his support line on the disallowed try is phenomenal. The way he spots it, just finds the space, is just utterly world class. It looks simple, but very few wingers do that. He's a core part of why and how the South Africa are just as good as they are. Maybe my favourite favorite thing however about the Springboks post World Cup is the way they've just gone 
come at us. There's no attempt to hide or change, and whilst there are shoots of evolution, the core ideas are all the same. Every game they play is as much a challenge to the next opponent as a dismantling of their current foe. The Springboks seem to love the fact that other teams are trying to figure them out, and yet they keep winning. In fact, they love it so much that lately, apparently, they've been looking for ways to publish it properly, but they've got no idea how. Now, has anyone seen the award-winning Chase in the Sun knows? I'm very tight with the Springbok camp. So I naturally asked director of rugby, Razzy Rasmus, have you considered maybe a website? And he replied, oh, no, no, no. I don't think I could be managing all that fiddly HTML web 2.0 nonsense now. At which point I asked him, have you ever heard of Squarespace. There was a long pause in which it became obvious that Razzie hasn't watched my videos in a while, at which point I told him that Squarespace is an outstanding all-in-one platform that allows you to make a truly quite beautiful website so easily. You can put together different pages without trouble, integrate a shop face for your business if you want one, you can even leak any video you like without hassle. At which point Razzie looked at me and he asked, That all sounds very well and good, you know, but is there some way that I could perhaps save a little bit of money on this purchase? You know, those lawyers from New York, they don't come cheap, but... And I said, why, of course. Just use the offer code SQUIDRUGBY and you'll be designing your own website in no time. And with that website on its way and the glorious stubbornness of their game plan, we're probably going to see every team this autumn series design new and innovative ways to try and dismantle the box. Four sets of world-class coaches, having had two years to ponder on how they beat them, they're now getting the chance. The spring box, and I kind of love it, leave the gauntlet on the floor and show almost no interest in return of adapting to the opposition. The only tweak we did see this week was something designed to target how Wales use their wingers. The default for a winger is to sit deeper than the main line and cover kicks. The Springbok way is to fly out line and cause pressure, but the Welsh way is for them to join the line and make it a kind of impervious iron blanket from touchline to touchline. No disconnect between the outside men. So this leaves things open for a little dink in behind. Pivak and defence coach Gavin Jenkins back the pace of Lewis Rissamit and the intelligence of Josh Adams to take care of this normally, but the box left it late and almost profited repeatedly. Here Pollard slides through last second, meaning the winger has no time to turn and the Candy Ram can re gather before chipping himself, eventually regathering and setting up a 16 phase attack in the 22, all from this one weak spot on the wing. South Africa is starting to evolve how they do attack with the ball in hand, but it really didn't feel effective against its iron blanket defence. Wales' defence is very flat and simple, but with more breakdown pressure thrown in than the All Blacks, and against both, South Africa have really struggled to finish once in 22, they've struggled to break them down through phase play. Their new approach is much more dynamic, trying to hide runners from view, entering the picture late with massive run-ups, but Wales' defence is about marking the space, not the men, and so it rarely posed that much of a problem. In fact, it actively caused the box some problems, bringing the runners a split second further away from their support and allowing the ever outstanding Alice Jenkins, for example, to sneak over the ball. If we rewind this slightly, Am here screws up his line, meaning Wales ignore him and only focus on Diego, which allows Jenkins to drop in behind the line so he can sprint in from behind the ruck to win the turnover. First time I watched this game, I did so as a Wales fan rather than as an objective observer I have on times two, three, and four, and I never once felt worried the spring box would cross our line through phase play. However, both England and Scotland, South Africa's next two opponents, defend very differently, both far more situation and personnel based, so this slight evolution could be something that comes off if Scotland in particular can't keep their eyes straight next week. Wales had a few other ways to attack the box. Now, this joins, no, honestly guys, the Boss Baby 2 family business is a good movie, as one of the top five phrases I've said the most over the last few weeks, but the entire spring box system is run by Dwayne Vermeulen, and if he's unavailable, the tight head prop takes over. They just all organise the defence. To demonstrate, take a look at this opportunity in the first half. Wales are setting up an attack and Vermeulen screams at Creel to get him and cut it off. This forces Dan Bigger to change his mind, cancel the move and take it in. And an unprepared Wales can't secure the ball. Springboks turn it over 90% down to Dwayne. So, Wales wound him up. This 2-on-1 for Reece Samet is one of two clear-cut try scoring opportunities in the entire game. And yet the origin is extremely simple. Vermeulen ends a breakdown, the referee penalises him, Adam Beer just keeps hold of him just in case anyway. And these two situations frustrate Vermeulen a lot and he loses focus on his own task. The Bok defence has failed to notice where his whip, nobody organising and Tompkins throws a stunning ball over Mapimpi who's cutting in as per the system. Jenkins then frees Zamet who would score if not for an unbelievable phenomenal tackle and effort by Sia Khaleesi. I mean I reckon if only Mapimpi and Yankees are tracking he probably scores but Khaleesi here, watch him, watch what he does, watch what he gets to, watch how he makes the tackle. I mean man alive he's playing well. He's just like he's... See, 
The box would need a whole other website just list all the world class stuff Seaclix has done this year. Like what a what a player. He's just playing unbelievably well at the minute, and he did on Saturday once again. For whatever reason, however, Wales just seemed to get really under Vermeulen's skin, and he found himself sucked in easier than ever, frequently giving away daft penalties of getting too caught up in one job to do another. Here he stood in the 13 channel, so Wales run the kind of move you'd imagine formed the basis of Pivac's plan A. McNichol is in at 10, Dan Bigger in the middle of nowhere here. These two players hold Vermeulen, and Bigger then comes in as bait. Creel cuts in and Davis and Adams can work the overlap. They set it up later to run with roles reversed between Bigger and McNichol, sending a runner right into Vermeulen to take him out, and then the next phase they play this move. But they don't have the dummy runners in place, so Thomas Williams targets the half hole instead, knowing it's not going to work. However, the best of the lot is right here. This is the best move Wales had. Wilgif John makes a very shit first impact of international rugby, tugging Quagga Smith's jersey until he steps away. Vermeulen is too busy organising outside him to notice, so the hole opens up for Ellis Jenkins, who bursts through. Dwayne Vermeulen is forced to make the tackle himself, and this fast phase then through Beard means the box pack is mostly taken up the picture. Once the ball reaches Tompkins, there's only four active defenders, four defenders who can do anything. Bigger wraps around late, and this takes out Pollard. And the dummy line by Josh Adams buys him a whole second, a hyper valuable current in international rugby and it causes both Am and Creel to cut in. Bigger floats it over and the box drift is good as disabled. Mpimpi is the only player who can probably get across here in time and with the rate he's going he's easily stepped by a finisher like Liam Williams except a pillock faced trash bag with decade old pants twaddles onto the pitch. Liam Williams has to adjust his line last second to avoid the new face of stop drinking whales and the chance ends up gone. Watched live and in the discourse immediately following, I thought this being a match-winning moment was being massively overblown by Welsh fans, that it was it was being talked about too much that Liam Williams probably got his line wrong. But watching it back, Wales have disabled the bot catch-up defence as well as anyone I've ever seen, and the fact Williams has to both slip by the pile-up on the floor and, actually kind of more importantly, go to step the second steward here kind of costs Wales big time. But, you know, anyway, let's... Enough of this boring back shit. Like, why are we talking about them? This was a game in the rain. So it's time to talk about the mall. Now, one of my favourite things about Rugby Union is the way it creates tiny little skills for people to perfect and the elements of the game that are so specific the most unlikely players can end up the kings or queens. One such example was found in this game right in the second row because Wales' Adam Beard is the best player in the world at defending the rolling mall. Often it's attributed to his silly arms, but South Africa only made major headway in two out of their eight rolling malls on Saturday and a hell of a lot of that, if not, you know, almost entirely all of it, was down to Adam Beard. Beard. His big trick is this, right? Instead of jumping, Beard positions his arms around the catcher but doesn't engage or make contact until their feet hits the ground. The jumper is always going to be a focal point of the mall, even after they smuggle the ball back, and he uses the leverage it gives him on the opposition to spin them out, wheeling half the opposition pack out of the drive, so they lose half of their strength, here forcing Mbanambi to break away. Here he does pretty much the same trick, and it means the bock pack are facing to the side and momentum halts, eventually only able to crab sideways before just collapsing it themselves. However, he also has plenty of other tricks. Here he goes for a chop tackle before the ball leaves the catcher, meaning it's a tackle and hence he can kind of get away with lying on the floor, becoming an obstacle South Africa can't surpass, forcing them to bring the ball down themselves where he fell. Or here, using SA's own momentum against them to splinter the pack into several groups. And then the two occasions where he can't do anything, where the box do get going forward, are kind of exceptions that prove the rule. Here, Vermeulen is blocking him getting around superbly, meaning the box mall can actually advance, Beard is essentially taken out of the game. However, this is maybe the smartest penalty anyone will concede all autumn. As the pack begins to accelerate, he binds on Naikani and then spins out and collapses them all. He's close enough to doing something legal that the referee will give him the benefit of the doubt and not bin him, but it's totally deliberate and it saves Wales a try. And Beard backs himself that if South Africa go for the corner, next time he'll just stop it legally, which he does. It goes down as a penalty against his name, but really it's the equivalent of a try-saving tackle. And so, sick of his shit, the Springboks use Adam Beard's own tactics against him for the eventual winning try by Malcolm Marks. Instead of using props, South Africa used two locks to lift the Mullen. This puts the jumper higher, meaning Beard can't get his arms around them while they're in the air, and then their bigger frames engage to prevent him engaging afterwards too. Beard is now just a passenger, but he's still got one trick left and he starts to wheel them more. However, the box are expecting it, wanting it. 
waiting for it. They've set up the mall so that splintering isn't a problem, so that it's designed to splinter into two separate little malls. Instead of taking out half the attack, this wheel removes the entire defence. Several Springboks sacrifice themselves to remove Beard and Sab Davis, meaning the beef behind can easily power to the line. Wales has one defence gone, and Mark's able to pop the ball down on the floor for the try that won them the game. Wales did an extremely good job of negating every South African strength except for the scrum, but the Springbok range of weapons is so deep and all of them are so powerful, it only took one scrum in their own half, one penalty milk with sheer power, to spark the try that won the game. It's hugely encouraging for South Africa. If every game is a gauntlet thrown down, the fact an opposition can meet the challenge in almost every area and still come out losers because of the one area where they couldn't shows just what a fearsome team they are. They next play Scotland, who showed in the Six Nations they can rise to most of those challenges and we'll have to see what it'll be when they take on another probably enthralling low scoring game. Wales, meanwhile, have had lots to take from this match. The crucial penalty that leads to the line out, for instance, comes from a rush of blood to the head by Tane Basham. Attacking Iraq, he probably shouldn't. And the severity of that moment will probably prevent him from doing that again. However, the Australia game coming out in two weeks just became a must win match. The team on the rise in the Welsh World Cup pool once again. And also the Welsh side need to remind themselves how to win rather than just learn lessons. It's now crucial they beat Mickey Hootboy and co by any margin. High or low scoring matters not and keep the rugby world from getting too topsy-turvy. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I got so engrossed and enthralled in making this video, editing it, that I missed a call from Brian Habana. Uh, but I am on his show, The Scrum, this week, if anyone wants to go and watch that. Uh, I've also got a podcast going on, looking at the 197 World Cup. If you want to go and look at that, there's no episode this week, but there'll be another one next week. Uh, and there's, you know, a few to catch up on, plus the entirety of the 2011 World Cup. Uh, I'll also be covering Scotland, Australia. That's coming next. That's what I'm moving on to right away uh, there's loads loads more going on but i am now quickly going to cover the refereeing decision because there's that video that did the rounds on uh saying it shouldn't have been it sh the the um, hoopy try shouldn't have been disallowed um that video is essentially bollocks designed to whip up controversy so let's go into that very quickly but in the meantime thank you for supporting the thing on patreon thank you for being lovely people and i'll see you soon otherwise for the, for the next bit so the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to watch the video as we go. The video's gone viral on the Mbimpi Disallowed track. Uh, there's a great amount of shit out by Alice Jenkins coming up here as he pats Sia Khaleesi on the stomach. Just a moment, it says cheers Sia as this drives us out because he's a hero and a legend. However, we get into the actual decision itself. And extra thing is, you know, normally I wouldn't do this. Normally I wouldn't do something so YouTube is weird. Um, but, right, so as I said, the referee decision is that they must retreat backwards. The same thing happens to Alice Jenkins in the first half. And I'll show that in a moment. Uh, however, so we see the kick obviously prepared and goes up. You want to keep it now. Malcolm Marks at the back of the truck here, right? Uh, so they label the onside players here. This is fine. This is also irrelevant to the point here. They point out Malcolm Marks as being offside. Uh, they then say only onside players are advancing, but you can clearly see Malcolm Marks is advancing. You can clearly see it in the video right here, as I'm highlighting separate to this. They say only onside players are advancing. That's bullshit. You can see an offside player advancing. It's all nonsense. It's designed to whip a controversy, which is not something rugby really needs. It's, it's furthering this kind of like almost victim complex building and it's just creating more negativity. And it's bullshit and it's annoying and I really, really kind of hate it. Um, so we need to drop this, stop this kind of thing immediately. It was not a legal try. It was perhaps pedantic and um, borderline and you can say harsh all you like, but the law is the law and it stands. As we can see, the same thing happens against Alice Jenkins in the first half here. Uh, he is minorly offside. He starts moving forward a split second before he's put onside. Um, he has less impact on the play than Marx is, and Marx is not involved pretty much at all. Um, so both are incredibly fast decisions, but both are entirely fair decisions. They think the referee was hot on all day, and he called repeatedly sharp for players to stay onside and so on. So it's consistent with how he's refereeing. Um, you know, you've also got the fact that the Springboks kick three points directly from this, and it leads to, you know, the Springboks having the lead that they do. If the referee wasn't refereeing this as harshly, then perhaps, you know, the Springboks are behind because they don't kick their three points, da -da 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 -da. the try still didn't put them ahead, etc. Um, so it's just, it's it's a ridiculous point to be making. And if it really gets me, the Springboks won anyway, you know? So why are you complaining about a correct refereeing decision? You weren't robbed at all. Just grow up, let it go. It isn't about moaning about the you know, quality of refereeing or whatever, because they got the right decision. Just let it go, move on with your lives. Don't complain anymore. I'm sorry to do this, I'm sorry to be so harsh, but it's really starting to drive me mad. Let's stop talking about refereeing, because there's far more to rugby than that. 
Got to be a penalty up here to Reds there. Yeah, it's clear.